Okay, once again, hello everyone. It is a great pleasure to have you all here and for this seminar uh, of the series of What is Seminars of the Center of Mathematics and Applications of Universidade de Beira Interior here in Covilhã, Portugal. Um, it is a great pleasure to have with us André Oliveira from the Center of Mathematics of Universidade do Porto and the uh, University of uh, Trajumontes e Alto Douro. Uh, thank you, André, for accepting our invitation. It is really a great pleasure to see you and have you in this series of seminars. Um, as I said before, this seminar will be recorded and later on we will post the, the, the video on the Kmaubi website. So... Uh, it's up to you now, Andre. And once okay. again, thank you, and thank you all for for coming. Okay, no, it's it's me who has to thank for this uh, great invitation. Thank you, Elder. Uh, it's a great pleasure to give this talk here. So um, I'm I'm going to be really truly elementary uh, on this subject. I mean, I was asked. Uh, by Elder to give uh, uh, an idea what, uh, about what's a moduli space. So that's, I'm not going to, gonna, going to enter in, uh, into details, technical details. So I'm, I'm, uh, I apologize if there is someone in the audience who is a uh, algebraic geometry or who really wants to know the, the true definitions of moduli space. This is not the correct place. I'm gonna give you an idea my goal is so that people get an idea what what are these objects okay all right so what's a moduli space so let's start then so mathematicians like uh, every human being we like to classify objects okay and uh, mathematicians have been trying to classify all sorts of objects for many many years since the greeks maybe before since the arabs and this quest on uh, uh, the classification really increased on the last century, in the 20th century. Uh, so for instance, uh, let's give just examples. So geometric shapes, we classify geometric shapes, platonic solids, uh, surfaces, uh, manifolds in general. Actually, classifications of manifolds is really still far from being achieved. Uh, curves, algebraic curves, uh, finite simple groups, which was a great achievement in the, in the last century, even already in the 21st century, I guess, um, the classification of finite simple groups. So we, we I mean, the, it's the, really the core of our work is really uh, classify things, classify objects. So to do that, we need to settle an equivalence relation. We, we need to say with what respect we are classifying things. So for instance, um, classif we can classify lines up to a fine transformation or just up to translation or just classify all lines. I mean, I'm, I'm gonna give, I'm gonna be more precise this, about all this in a few moments. We can classify triangles up to congruence or just up to similarity. We can classify surfaces up to homeomorphism or curves up to algebraic isomorphism. So we have to settle an equivalence relation to start classifying things. Um, and sometimes, or not sometimes, often, this equivalence relation is really given by an action of a group on an ambient space. So lines in the plane up to a fine transformation, there's an action of the affine group, uh, which, uh, and we want to, to, to describe the orbits of this group action. Or lines up to, the, up to translation, there's the translation group. And, or if we want all lines, then the group acting is the trivial group. There's nothing there. Or the triangles up to congruence is the Euclidean group, the isometries, right? Or up to similarities, the similarity group, which is the isometries plus the scalings. Okay, so there's a, often a group acting here. All right, so we like to classify things, but I mean, this is a, 
this quest of classifying things is not just a mathematician's uh, quest. Uh, I mean, all sciences, biology, chemistry, uh, we are always uh, quest trying to classify things. But we take the classification quest into a whole new level because uh, we aim not only to classify, but then we want to study the spaces of classes by itself. This is like, I don't know, it's like the chemistries studying the periodic table by itself, right? Uh, so we aim to classify mathematical objects, but then we have a space of classes and we want to study that space. This is the good thing of mathematics because that space of, of, of classes is, all, is still a mathematical object. And then we can study it, okay? This space of classes is going to be, very roughly speaking, is going to be the, a moduli space. So what's a moduli space? Um, um, it's a notion which arises from algebraic geometry. Uh, it's arising from classification problems of objects in algebraic geometry. And um, so we need basic ingredients. Uh, so we have a class A of objects, geometrical objects, which we want to classify. And then we have an equivalence, we fix an equivalence relation on A, right? And then we want the space, this M here, the space of equivalence uh, classes of those objects. And this is going to be our moduli space, okay? This is not the, the rigorous definition, it's just given an, an idea. And I'm being here very vague about the word space, okay? So this space, in general, if we are in algebraic geometry, is a variety or a scheme. I'm not even defining that. But here I'm going to restrict myself to its uh, maybe topological and manifold structure. So let's forget all these more um, finer, finer structures which are arising in algebraic geometry and let's stick ourselves to topological space or manifold, okay? So this space is going to be uh, topological space, but um, so this is going to be our moduli space with respect of objects in A with respect to the given uh, equivalence relation. And so each point in M, okay, corresponds uniquely to an equivalence class of objects in A, okay? So we're, gonna, we're going to see examples of this. Uh, basically, all the talk is going to be about examples. All right, but we want, uh, we want more than this. We don't want just this to be a set. We want more. We want this to have a natural topology and geometry, which reflects the, the properties of the objects in our collection uh, under the equivalence relation. What do I mean by this? I mean, so I want to the topology of this M to, so if we have a topology, we can say when two points are close or far apart from each other. And we want those, that topology to reflect how close two classes are to each other. Okay. And we want the topology to, to, to reflect also how those classes vary, okay? And moreover, how, did, how they degenerate. And also I want the topology and the geometry to show, to indicate the existence of certain special objects among our classes, okay? So this is not merely a set, it has to have a topology which encodes or uh, which uh, reflects all these properties, okay, in general. Okay, we're gonna see this in examples. So, well, first let's 
start with uh, somehow degenerate examples. So sometimes the objects that we are considering do not admit continuous variations. Uh, so they give rise to discrete moduli spaces, which are, I mean, points, count them, perhaps a finite or countable number of points. Okay, so, uh, so in this case, the objects do not admit uh, very continuous variations, so are rigid. And so let's see examples. So let's su suppose we want to consider, so this, first of all, these are kind of artificial examples, okay? They are so degenerate, they are somehow artificial. That's why I'm calling here moduli spaces between qu quotes, but uh, anyway. So suppose we want to classify finite dimensional vector spaces up to linear isomorphism. Well, these are easily classified. They, we all know that vector spaces are classified by their dimension. If you have two vector spaces of the same dimension, then they are isomorphic. Okay, so here's the, we have dimension zero, dimension one, two, three, and so on. So the moduli space is just this number of points, this, uh, is this countable number of points is n or n zero if you want, okay? So no, no much things here. So if you want other things, if you want to classify closed oriented surfaces up to homeomorphism, and here by closed, I mean uh, compact surfaces and without boundary. So these kinds, okay? So these kinds of surfaces are classified by their genus, by homeomorphism, okay? by the number of holes. So the genus is again a discrete invariant. So uh, here, they, here they are, it's the same thing. Genus zero, you have the sphere. In genus one, you have the torus, genus two and genus three and so on, all right? If you have two compact oriented surfaces without boundary with the same genus, then surely they, you can, they are homeomorphic. So they are in the same class. Okay, so the, again, the moduli space is not very interesting, is the number of points. Okay, a countable number of points. All right, and even an even more uh, dramatic example, if you want to classify lines up to a fine transformation, if you have two lines up to a fine transformation, so it, whenever you have two lines, there is an affine transformation which takes one line to the other. So all lines up to a fine transformation are the same. There's no, there's no, okay. So the moduli space here is just a point, okay. So there's, there is just one class. All right, okay. So let's now go to, oh, I forgot to say, I mean, if, if someone wants to ask a question or something, just stop me and if you want, I'll, I'll answer. Uh, okay, so, now let's go to more uh, interesting stuff. So in the previous uh, slide, things were rigid. You cannot deform a point to a line, to a line and so on, right? There is no continuous deformations. So now let's go to the existence and con of continuous deformations. And now the first example, let's consider circles. And so, so here's the, the, the interesting stuff starts arising here. Okay, so let's suppose we want to, to, to classify circles up to congruence, okay? So up to congruence, two circles are the same if they have the same radius, right? Exactly when they have the same radius. So that's the radius which classifies circles. So here's the moduli space. The moduli space is the R plus, all right? Okay. Um, so for each point of R plus, you have a circle and a unique and, and uh, you have a, uh, an equi equivalence class of circles up to congruence, okay? Here's the, and so you can see here that the, the equivalence relation that we are fixing is important. Okay, because if we were taking circles up to homeomorphism, then all of them were, were the same. All circles are homeomorphic, but up to congruence, the things is not the same, okay? 
All right. So here, this moduli space is uh, connected, smooth, non-compact manifold. And you see here, it already starts appearing that the, those things that we want that a moduli space has. Okay, so this encodes the continuous variations of circles up to congruence, right? So if it is, since it's connected, it means that any circle can be continuously deformed into an, any other circle. You just, right? You increase or decrease the radius, right? So it means you can, you can connect any two points here in terms of circles means that you're deforming one to the other, right? It's smooth, it's a smooth manifold. So this means that there are no special circles. There are no circles with extra symmetries. All circles are equally symmetric, okay? Now, another thing. So if you see here, the zero, zero is a, is a, is a boundary point on our moduli space, right? But it's, so it's in the closure, Sorry, not, not a boundary point. It's in the closure of our moduli space, but it's not in the moduli space. So this means that I can consider zero as a dege degeneration of circles. So I can consider a point as a degenerate circle of radius zero, right? Okay. On the other hand, if I consider in a R plus union with infinity, here, if I, can, if I add infinity to this space, right? so infinity is still a, uh, in the closure of our moduli space, but not in it. And again, so things which are in the closure, but not in the moduli space can be seen as degenerations of the objects that we are considering. So this means that I can see the line at infinity in the plane, there is a line at infinity and you can consider it as a degenerate circle of radius infinity. All right. So again, so all these are general principles of moduli spaces, these, these things, okay? So connectedness means that you can deform any object into another one, smooth, that there, there are no uh, special objects, and things in the closure, but not in the space, means that there are degenerate things. Right. Okay. So still in the circles. So we see here, there's a family of circles over the obvious family over the moduli space. Okay. So here's the, so if you have our, your moduli space R plus, and so for uh, over each R here, let me see if I can, over each R here, uh, you can uh, consider the circle of radius R center at the origin, okay? And so this gives you a family of circles, the obvious family of circles over each point of, our, of the moduli space. So over R, you have a circle of radius R, okay? So now suppose you have any other space. And again, here I'm being vague about the word space. Let's suppose it's a topological space, okay? So if you're in really in outright geometry, this should be a variety or something, but let's suppose you, you have any space. And suppose you have a map from this space to R plus. Then from this map, uh, you can construct a family of circles over this other space. How? So I'm going to build a family of circles parameterized by this other space. How, how do I do that? So the circle given by the point T in T is just going to be the circle given, given by F, T, F of T, right? F of T is here, and here I have a, uh, an obvious circle of so radius F of T, OK? And so given any point in T, I have a circle given by it, okay? So this is, this is a, called a, the pullback of this family U to my space T, all right? Conversely, 
So out of a out of a map from a space from a, any space to R plus, I have a family of circles parameterized by that space. But now conversely, if you have a family of circles parameterized by any space, then you build a map from that space to our moduli space. How do I do that? How am I going to be building it this map? You just define it f of t. So you have a family of circles parameterized by t. So for each t, for each point in t, you have a circle there, right? So how do you define it, the map there? So f of t gives you the radius of the circle determined by the point that you have. OK, so you see that you have, we have two directions here. From a map, you build a family of circles on that space. And from a family of circles on that space, you build a map. Okay. Now, these procedures may not be inverse to each other. In this case, actually, I mean, this is general. This is general. This is just an example of a general phenomenon. Uh, but these procedures, in general, may not be inverse to each other. Actually, here in the circle, in this example of circles, they are. Okay, but let's see then an example where they are not. Okay, another example. So let's now look at lines in R2 up to translation. So I say that two lines are the same when I can translate one to the other, right? So namely, when they are, they give you, you know, when they they are parallel. Okay, so they are. So this is the same as saying I'm parameterizing all lines in R2 through the origin, because I can, can take any line through a line parallel to it through the origin. OK, so a line through the origin is given by a direction, completely determined by a direction, which is determined by a non-zero vector. So the moduli space is called the real projective line, which is RP1. And this is what? This is just r, r squared minus zero modulo this equivalence relation. So r squared minus zero is giving me the origin. The, sorry, is giving me the direction, right? It's a vector, a non-zero vector, right? And if I if you have two non-zero vectors which are multi, multiple of each other, of course they give you the same direction. So they give you the same line. Okay, so that's why I have to, to mod out by this equivalence relation. So this is the real projective line. This is the moduli space of all lines in R2 uh, through the origin, which is the same as all lines in R2 up to translation. Okay, so let's just, so, but let, let's now take a slightly different. Um, uh, uh, approach. So I could think as a line through the origin, it's completely determined by the angle that line makes uh, with, the, with the x axis, right? Right? So there is a bijection between the, this moduli space and the interval 0 pi because I want to, to, to vary theta from zero to pi, opening pi, right? Okay, but this is a bijection. So why don't we say that this is the moduli space, zero pi? Well, this is a bijection between sets, but it turns out that this guy here has not the correct topology that we want. Why? Because recall that we want in the moduli space to reflect the fact that when two, two objects are close to each other, then the points should be close to each other on the moduli space. Well, this is not the case here. Because so the topology here is not the correct one. So the point zero, theta equals zero, so the line, this line here, and the points pi minus a very small epsilon are very far apart in this interval, but they are very close. They are two lines over the origin which are very close to each other, right? So, okay, so this is not the correct topology. We cannot put here 
the topology of this of this uh, interval. It's not the correct thing to do. All right. You see the problem. So these these two lines are correspond to points here, which are, are far apart. But the lines are very close to each other. One of them is a really a small deformation of the other. All right. So what's the from this point of view, from the point of view of the interval, what's the correct thing to do? So the correct thing to do is that you just close the interval on pi, and then you you identify the points zero and pi. Right? So zero must be pi on this closed interval. So you glue you glue the, the two extremes of the interval. So what we get, we get a circle. All right. Okay, so now let's uh, a slightly different perspective of the same of the same uh, problem. So we're still looking at all lines in R two through the origin, and now we get um, so each point. Now consider the line y equals one. So each point of the line y equals one corresponds to exactly one line through the origin, right? And all lines through the origin are obtained this way, except one, except this one. The line y equals zero does not define any point in the line y equals one, right? Okay, so, but now if you, if you consider points in this line y equals one with, with x very, very large or with x very, very small, then the lines become uh, very similar again. Okay, so and similar and close to the missing line, to the line, so the, they become close to the line y equals zero. So the idea is the same. So you, we have to compactify this line y equals one to add add a point at infinity and then glue again, right? And again, this yields a circle. All right. So it turns out that this this uh, real projective uh, line, so which I told you at the beginning that this is a moduli space. If you consider here the natural topology, and the natural topology here is the quotient topology. So you have a map. There's a it's a quotient, so it's a quotient topology. This is really indeed homeomorphic homeomorphic to a circle. Okay, so this is really, I mean, that's why this is the moduli space, or I mean, this has the, the natural topology of this space really encodes the variation of lines and it's a, it's really a homeomorphic to a circle. And it's a compact, smooth manifold of dimension one, homeomorphic to a circle. So compact means that you, there is no degeneration of lines. You see, there is no way to de degenerate a line through the origin to any other kind of object, and there is, there are no special lines among uh, uh, through the origin and so on. Okay, so again, here we we have the same picture as these families uh, parameterized by a space, but I'm, let's talk about that afterwards. All right, so the, the, this was the, the real projective line. But then there are, this is just a one example of much more, uh, much more general objects, which I'm going to describe here very briefly. Uh, so if we wanted lines through the origin, origin, not in R2, but in R3, then the same definition, analogous definition, just gives you RP2, which is the real projective plane. And this is now a non orientable compact two manifold. You can try to, if you want, try to, to, to sketch it. Uh, if you want the same problem, complex lines through the origin in C2, then you have CP1, the complex projective space. And this is going to be homeomorphic to the two sphere. So it's a two-dimensional, a real two-dimensional thing, okay? And um, in general, this is a general, this is general construction. So, so lines through the origin are one-dimensional vector spaces. 
right? Over. So if you want V any finite dimensional vector space over a field K, then the moduli space of one dimensional vector subspaces is called the projective space. Okay, and, the, and you see here, the, the definition is exactly the same as I gave you for, P1, for RP1. You take all non-zero vectors and declare that they are the same when they are multiple of each other by a scalar on your field. All right, so this is a, a very classical object in, in geometry. And actually, if instead of considering one dimensional subspace, you can consider R dimensional subspaces of V, where of course R is less than or equal than the dimension of V. And this gives you another classical object in geometry, which is called the Grassmannian. Okay, so the projective space is the particular case of the Grassmannian where R is one. Okay, so I'm not going to talk much more about these spaces, just to say that these are moduli spaces of these objects, and these are very, very classical objects in algebraic geometry. Okay, so let's continue now. So we already saw lines up to a fine transformation. The moduli space is just one point. Lines up to translation, the moduli space is, is the real projective line, so which is homeomorphic to a circle. And now suppose we want to consider all lines. So all lines. So uh, there are any two different lines. That there's no equivalence relation. All lines are different. Okay. So how do I consider? How do I parameterize all lines in the plane in R two? So to specify a line, I need a direction, and then, then I need the real number, which is going to give me a sign distance between curve to the origin. So how do I how do I give you this? So let's consider, again, a similar thing. So let's consider LT, L theta, the line through the origin making an angle theta with y equals zero, with the x-axis, OK? So this gives me a family of lines in R2, all of them perpendicular to L theta. So this is the picture. So once I give you L theta, I automatically give you infinitely many perpendicular lines in R2, perpendicular to this, to this one, OK? So uh, how do I single out one of them here? So, so first of all, yeah, first of all, all lines in R2 are obtained this way once I vary theta from 0 to pi. OK, but now, suppose theta is not 0. So suppose you're here, but now theta is not 0. So orient this, this line towards y, y positive. So orient this line through the positive, uh, positive side of the y-axis, OK? And if, and if uh, theta is 0, orient through. So if theta is 0, you have this line, so orient this way. So we have this picture here, OK? Now, so I'm choosing an orientation to all these lines. And now I give you two numbers. One is theta here, and then r, which is a real number, possibly negative. And this gives me a line in, in R2, which is the unique line perpendicular to L theta, whose sine distance of their intersection to the origin according to the orientation of L theta is R. Okay, so what's this? So I'm, I'm, I give you an orientation, right? And so this line here, for instance, it's S theta R with R positive. So R is this distance here. And it's positive because it's on the positive side of, of uh, L theta, right? So this line here is, of course, S theta 0, because it passes through the origin. And the lines on this side are S theta R prime with R prime negative. This distance, but then you take the negative number. And this is a way to single out uh, lines here. OK, so this way, all I parameterize all lines in R2 in our are given by this. But now again, we have a similar problem that we had before. 
because this is not the correct topology. Again, uh, angles zero and, and theta and pi minus a small thing correspond to lines which are very close to each other if you pick the same distance here. Okay, so, so we have to do the same thing. You add pi, so you add, uh, and then you orient the, the, so by adding pi, you con you're considering this line, but now you orient onto the negative side of, of, of the x axis because you want things to be, you want things to be co uh, coherent. So you're, you're, you're taking this orientation, right? So this line, which is very close to pi is oriented to this side. So if you want things to vary continuously, you have to consider this line L pi oriented to the negative side of X. Okay, so we, but now if you add pi, right? So you have L zero there and now you have L pi, which is there. So it's everything but oriented on that side. But now I'm, I'm, now I'm considering, uh, I can consider the same line by two different uh, numbers or by two different parameters. For instance, this line here is give is S01 because it's corresponds to theta equals zero and R equals one positive because it's on the positive side, right? Of, of the orientation of L zero, but it's also S pi minus one because it's S pi, but, and now it's minus one because this is on the, on the negative part of the orientation that I gave you to uh, L pi, okay? So what do I have to do? So the moduli space is the product of zero pi closed interval times R, but now you have to consider these two numbers, these two parameters, these two pairs the same, zero R and pi minus R because of this, because they, they give you the same line, okay? All right, so what's this? What is this? You're taking zero pi, zero pi, and now you're taking R, in, in uh, everywhere, right? But in zero, you want the, the point zero R to be the same as the point pi minus R. So what are we doing? We are considering this, but we are identifying this side with this side and twisting. So what we get? The Mobius band. So the moduli space of all lines in R2 is the Mobius band. Open Mobius band means open because I'm taking uh, R to be open. So here's the moduli space. Of all lines is the Mobius band. All right, another example. So the moduli space of triangles up to similarity, okay? Let's consider the moduli space of triangles up to similarity. Uh, since I'm considering up to similarity, I can uh, fix the, I can shrink them or enlarge them. I can, let's fix the perimeter to be one, let's say. And so what we are really considering is the moduli space of triangles of perimeter one, but, and now up to congruence. So how do I define a triangle up to congruence of this uh, perimeter one? I just give you one way of defining it is by the length of their sides, the three positive numbers, and I'm normalizing them so that they are in increasing length, it's just a normalization here. This is the triangle inequality, right? X is, and this is the perimeter to be one. Now, if you look in R3 and you try to sketch this in R3, you end up with a right triangle. So this is this, this space, this is this space, and you have to imagine this living inside R3. Okay, so this is the moduli space of triangles up to similarity. All right, so what is this? So each point here corresponds to a, to a triangle. So what is this? Let's see. So if you, if you look careful, carefully, uh, 
these guys in this, so any point here corresponds to a triangle of perimeter one, and, and the different points correspond to different triangles up to congruence. So the points here in this, uh, so here you have the isosceles tri triangles with short bases, so things like this. Oops. Then they are slightly increasing. I'm not, uh, this should be shorter. Uh, like this. Then you end up here with the equi equilateral triangle. It's the unique equilateral triangle of perimeter one. Then they are start, then you start on this, on this, uh, on this line here, you start with isosceles triangles with wide bases. And now here you have degenerate triangles. You see, this is non-compact. This line does not belong to the moduli space. And this is degenerate triangles as segments, line segments. Okay. And here on this space here, you have the acute triangles. Here you have the obtuse triangles. And you have this line there, which corresponds to right triangles of perimeter one. Okay, so if you have here everything. Okay, so this is M is not compact, as I told you. So this is the same thing. So you can compactify this by adding this line, and you consider this as degenerate triangles, as we already saw in the case of the circle, this is degenerate things. Now here we have a new phenomenon. You, this, this space, you can think of it as not being smooth because you can think of this boundary as the singularities of this space. So the boundary of M, think of it as singularities, corresponds to special triangles. And here they are, they are isosceles triangles. And isosceles triangles have extra symmetries. So if you consider strict isosceles triangles, so the ones which are not equilateral, then they are they have more symmetries than the scalene ones. The scalene ones have no symmetries whatsoever, so no symmetries. But the isosceles triangles have Z2, namely the reflection on the on the on the axis, right? But even then, but then we have this space, this this point here, which is even more singular. You can think of this point here as an even more singular point of the moduli space. And that means, so a worst singularity, that means it's as, it has even more symmetries. And it does. I mean, the symmetries of the, of the um, equilateral triangle is larger than Z2, is the, the diadral group. So it has order six, right? So singularities of the moduli space correspond to special objects. As I, Okay, here's an example. So here's a general slogan. The geometry and topology of moduli space itself gives information on the individual objects that are being parameterized. Okay, so now let's see these families of triangles. So I told you before, I'm going to just recap this. Uh, so out of a space, and if you have a map, take any space and suppose you have a map onto my, our M. And if that space, uh, so here I have a family of triangles. Over each point, I have a triangle. Okay, so I so this map gives me a family of triangles over this space just by pullback. Okay, the triangle over this guy is the triangle over its image. Okay, and then conversely, if you have a family of triangles over uh, T, then I have a map to M such that f of t is the point on m corresponding to the triangle determined by t. This is the thing I'm repeating, the thing that I told you before. So now let's see that this is an, these are not inverse in this case. All right, so there, these two procedures are not inverse from each other. There may be non-isomorphic families parameterized by t, which gives the same map onto m. And here I'm being very sloppy because I'm not, I didn't tell you there is the precise notion of family. I didn't tell you that, what's that? And so I didn't even tell you what's an isomorphism of families. I'm skipping all that. 
But these, these notions are also part of the basic data of a moduli problem. When you have a, something you want to classify, you have to settle what you mean by a family and the isomorphism by, of families. But let's continue. So let's see the, an example of two families which give the same map. So suppose T is a circle. And let's continue with the same moduli space, moduli space of triangles, and consider the constant map, all right? It's the constant map equal to the equilateral triad. So how do I build a family in T out of this map? So remember, at each point of T, you, 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 you consider the triangle given by F of T. But F of T is, cons is constant here. So the family is the constant family. You, you're putting all the same triangle in all points of T. So think of T as a circle, right? This point is the same as this one, so boo them, okay? And all the, all the triangles that you're considering is the equilateral triangle of perimeter one. So this is one family, but now let's twist this family. Twist this family by twisting one extreme affected by a symmetry it has. And this is important that it, it has this symmetry in D3, so the dihedral group. So let's, for instance, rotate it by two pi over three. This is a rotation, it's an element here. So, and then twist and glue the extremes because we are in the circle. So consider this, right? So you, I guess you can understand. So I'm twisting this, I'm twisting this to obtain this, right? The important thing is that we end up in the same position as this because we have to glue things because we are in a circle. So it turns out that these two, these two families are different families of triangles over the circle, which give rise to the same map because the triangles are always the same, are always the equilateral triangle, but the families are not the same, okay? Two non-isomorphic families over T, both giving rise to the same map. So that's why they are not inverse to each other, those, those procedures. So only this family is the pullback. You can, this family here is not the pullback of anything. Okay, and this example would not work if T was an interval and not a circle, because I mean, these two families over, over an interval, if, if this point is not the same as this one, then these two families are isomorphic because you can just pick on this one and, and twist this side and twist this side and obtain that. But over a circle, you cannot do that because things are good. It's like I'm twisting the, the, the Mobius band onto a cylinder. You cannot do that. All right, so let's now... Um, so here's a more... I told you that in the abstract that I was not going to give a definition of moduli space. Here's a rough, slightly more, uh, uh, slightly more uh, rigorous, not completely rigorous definition of moduli space, of fine moduli space. So what's a fine moduli space? It's a space whose points are in one-to-one -one correspondence with equivalence classes of objects that we are considering that uh, such that families parameterized by any space give rise to maps and maps gives rise to families from a space. And then if two families giving rise the same map, then they must be isomorphic families. This is the definition of fine moduli space. So we just saw that the moduli space of triangles is not, not a fine moduli space because there is no bijection. There is this not okay, but if we if we consider so sorry let me just go back a little bit I'm sorry, so this example here would not work if we consider an, a scalene triangle because then we couldn't we wouldn't have a, a symmetry to play this game, right? Scalene triangles do not have symmetries, so uh, Andrea. I'm sorry, once you went back to this slide, there is a question in the chat. Yeah. Maybe sorry. it has to yeah. do with the previous slide. Maybe it's a good time to, to see. Amir is asking when we are working with symmetry classes, what do we mean by twisting? 
uh, when we are working with symmetry, I mean, I mean, here twisting was a, just a twisting means, I mean, I'm just considering uh, twisting here is not a, there's no, uh, there's no um, very rigorous mathematical definition here. This word twist is just a way to obtain this family, sorry, a way to obtain this family here out of this one. And it's, you can see how, how you do it. You pick up this side and you twist by, so what I'm, what I'm applying here for these for this, uh, two pictures, I'm applying here a rotation of two pi over three to this triangle, to this last triangle. I'm rotating it and obtaining this. But of course, I cannot do that only to the last triangle. I have to do it in a continuous way so that everything, of course, things in the middle get half twist or something, right? Uh, but the important thing here is that I couldn't do this because in a, of, if, if the triangles were not equilateral, because this wouldn't give me, I wouldn't end up on the same triangle. The important thing, okay? So twist here is just a vague word to, to obtain, to do this procedure here, all right? Okay, um, so the moduli space of scalene triangles, that is indeed a fine moduli space, which means that you're taking, we're taking just the open, the interior of that triangle of, uh, of this, uh, sorry. Uh, I'm sorry, let me go there. In the moduli space of scalene triangles, I'm, I'm taking out this, this part here. I'm just taking the interior. And that, that means that, uh, and then that, that's going to be a, a, a fine moduli space. Okay, so let's continue. Um, so in general, fine moduli spaces do not exist. So, what mathematicians do is that they have two alternatives. They relax the definition and consider coarse moduli spaces, which, I mean, I, what I'm going to say now is not completely true, but you can think of it, just take out this last condition, which was the one which failed for the moduli space of, tri of uh, triangles. So relax the definition. And all these moduli spaces, have been, I mean, that there are methods to construct them by GIT, uh, geometric invariant theory by Mumford, or you can consider other types of objects which are called stacks. Uh, these are much more so sophisticated objects. Actually, they are not geometric objects. Then you're entering in the, in the world of categories, but they remember the symmetries that the objects the carry. So I'm, I'm not going to enter into that. All right. Oh, uh, how much time do I have? I'll say 10 minutes. It is okay for you? Yeah. Okay. We have a, what's the term, another question. Erko is, is replying that, but you could rotate the full circle. I think it is thinking on. on, on oh, sure, sure, sure. But if I. Yeah, yeah, if I would rotate the full circle, I would end up with the same thing. The, then, that's the thing. Then I would, would end up with an isomorphic family. That's the thing I'm not, I'm not, okay? If you rotate with a full circle, then the two families would be isomorphic. Okay, so that's not a, yeah, yeah, sure. But then you wouldn't end up with the same. So, so that's the thing I'm, I'm not uh, saying very, uh, explicit why, but they, they would be isomorphic families, okay? All right, so, so all examples I gave you so far are really, really toy baby examples of moduli spaces. So, so now I'm gonna be, so now things are going to be more, slightly more advanced but I'm, I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I'm going to be very vague still. I just want you to, I don't want you to come up with the idea that this, these are all these basic things. So what I just told you so far, it's really toy examples. 
So the true modelized spaces are in general quite difficult to construct. And the first example, historically, the first true example was the modelized space MG of compact Riemann surfaces. So compact Riemann surface, you can think of it in two ways. For I mean, you can think these are the same as uh, algebraic curves. So compact Riemann surfaces are um, uh, complex manifolds of complex dimension one, so real dimension two, but they have a complex structure. So th think of them as uh, surfaces, uh, I mean, geometrically, of genus G. So this was historically the really first non-trivial example of which has been considered. So note that I'm fixing the genus. So genus, and this is a general principle of modelized spaces. If you want to classify an object, then fix first the discrete invariants. We already saw that in surfaces, the genus, the number of holes, is a discrete invariant. So, but now if we want to, so surfaces for a fixed genus are all the same as topological objects but they are not the same as compact Riemann surfaces. Okay, this is the difference. All right, so, so this space was first considered by Riemann in 1857, and he was the one who came up with the term moduli. And he knew that this space is a um, complex manifold, the moduli space of complex dimension 3G minus three. All right, this is a quotation of his work. So there's a three G minus three. Oh. oh, I forgot here, but of course this, oh, maybe let me put here genus at least two, otherwise the dimension is not correct. Uh, okay. So, but then the first precise definition of modelized space was done by Mumford in general. And he came up with methods of constructing them by geometric invariant theory. And he constructed this modelized space of curves by, again, by this method. So he won the Fields Medal by this, uh, by this, uh, by employing geometric invariant theory to the construction of modelized spaces. And so here's a picture of, um, so you have M2, so modelized spaces of genus two Riemann surface. So you have two Riemann surfaces, which are similar to each other. So they correspond to closed points in the moduli space, but then you have a Riemann surface, which is far apart from the other one. So it corresponds to a point, which is far from the other two. As topological surfaces, all these are the same, but not as, okay. So this space MG is really currently under very intense research. Okay, people are studying this space. So for instance, uh, Mirza Kani, again, she, she won uh, again the, the, Fields, the Fields Medal because of her studies on this space, dynamical studies and geometrical studies. Okay, so now let's consider now things which are closer to me. So vector bundles. So let's consider X to be one of those compact Riemann surfaces of genus two. So what's a vector bundle? on X. Think of it as a family of vector spaces over your points in X, okay? Which of, of dimension N, this is the rank, rank N, holomorphic vector bundle of rank N, N is the dimension of the vector spaces that you put on the, on the, on the points. And these vector spaces vary holomorphically with the point in X. And moreover, it must be locally trivial. So they cannot vary in a wild way. So locally at each point in X as a neighborhood so that your vector bundle is locally a product. So it's something you can imagine like this, okay? So this is a rank one uh, vector bundle. This is a rank two because the, the, the spaces are rank two. And here, so here's a, a Mobius band. Mobius band is a rank one vector bundle of the circle. Again, this moduli space has been constructed by Mumford again, 62. So he constructed the moduli space of vector bundles of degree D. So degree D is a, a discrete invariant. 
so I'm not going to explain this. Uh, this double slash means the GIT quotient. But anyway, the important thing is that there are, he constructed this by geometric invariant theory, which is a method in algebraic geometry. But then in 65, Narasimhan and Seshadri gave a new interpretation of this moduli space as representations of the fundamental group of X into the unitary group. And then Donaldson in 83 uh, gave an even new uh, interpretation of this moduli space as solutions of the equations coming from physics, which are called Young-Mills equations. So this is a compact projective variety of, of complex dimension n squared g minus one plus one. And it's smooth if and only if n and d are co-prime and fine, it's also fine. So now Higgs bundles. So a Higgs bundle on X is a pair where V is a vector bundle, just as before, and phi is just a map from V. So there are maps between vector bundles, V to V tensor, by the cotangent bundle to our curve, to our Riemann surface X, okay? So don't, 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 uh, I don't want you to, I don't expect you to understand this, but I mean, I'm not even uh, giving motivation for these objects, but they arise from many different points of view and their moduli space has been built. Uh, so this, so these were on a, on a Riemann surface, they were constructed considered by Hitchin in 87, and then Simpson in 94 constructed for higher dimensional uh, manifolds, complex manifolds. Uh, but let's stick with the case of Riemann surfaces. So this uh, is a non-compact, now it's non-compact variety of the dimension twice as the moduli space of vector bundles. And uh, what I want you to is to, to take you home, to take home is that this is a space with an extremely rich geometric and topological structure. And this is where I work, to study the geometry and topology of the moduli space of Higgs bundles. So let me, let me skip this, not too important. Let me just give you an idea of that. So for that, let's consider these Betty numbers. So what's a Betty number of a space? So for, first of all, there are K Betty numbers or K plus one. Um, K varies between zero and the dimension of the space. And so the Kth Betty number is the dimension of the Kth the RAM cohomology of our space. Okay, again, let's, uh, I mean, think of this as counting the K dimensional poles of Y. Um, okay, so, Let's, I mean, this is a, an invariant, a topological invariant of a space. And a space is topological. So it's a way to see it as a space is uh, as a rich or, or not so rich topology or geometry. So for instance, a point, k petty numbers of a point is just one. Of the Euclidean space, all of them are zero except the first one, which is one. So Euclidean space is a very, basic topology. Of the circle, there are only two, one, one. Of the M-sphere, only the first and the last are non-zero and are one. Okay, so the projective space, complex projective space, the Grassmannian of uh, two-dimensional subspaces of C4. So you see all of them are more or less uh, basic back T numbers. So, and even so, these already are very interesting spaces. But now let's go to moduli space of vector bundles. The moduli space of vector bundles in rank two, only rank two and genus two, very basic things, their Betty numbers are already uh, these numbers, so much more complicated and they were found by Newstead and Atia, Atia bot. But now for Higgs bundles in genus two still and rank two still, so very low invariants, they are, even more complicated. And they are, um, there's one thing here. If you notice these, these, these numbers are uh, symmetric, but here these numbers are not symmetric anymore. And this is because this space is compact and this space is not compact. 
But now if you go to gene to rank three and still genus two, Peter Cotton found it in uh, 1995 that the betty numbers of rank three Higgs bundles moduli space are already quite wild. Okay. And then, I mean, so this is an instance why these spaces are really, really very rich from a topological point of view. And so uh, well, let me, it's, I, I, I'll end up in two minutes, or one minute. So in general, there's a notion of G Higgs bundles for any Lie group G. And there's a, a moduli space of G Higgs bundles. And then in, in general, their topology is completely unknown. And so except the number of its connective components. And now for some Lie groups, this moduli space of G Higgs bundles have some exotic components, which a priori shouldn't be there. And there are some classes of Lie groups which that is known for a long time to happen. And sometimes uh, at some point people conjecture that those were the two only classes where those uh, exotic components appear. But then we found out uh, in uh, 2019, a new class of Lie groups where this space has new exotic components, namely the uh, groups, orthogonal groups with a signature. And recently, we completely classified all the groups for which these spaces admit these exotic components and describe them. And these, these, all these uh, things are deeply related with a new area of mathematics, which is becoming very, uh, uh, becoming quite studied, which is called higher technical theory. Okay, so just to end up, Higgs bundles and their moduli spaces, they are very deep connections to representation theory, algebraic topology. I mean, this is a theory in algebraic geometry, but it has very deep connections with many other areas. And they are really uh, uh, even becoming famous if you look at these uh, books by Edward Frankel, this is the English edition. Uh, this is a mathematician, and he tells here the story of his life as a mathematician. And but in Higgs bundles also appear. So this is the English and the Portuguese edition also appear here for the general public. Okay, thank you, obrigado, and then end up with some references. Sorry, sorry for the. <laughs> for the Thank you so much, and, uh, Thank you. I'm glad. Thank you for this really nice talk. Uh, I don't know if someone has some comment or question to for Andre. You can unmute your micro and speak or chat. Oh, hello. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Uh, I had a quick question. So are people interested in classifying moduli spaces themselves? Uh, for example, up to homeomorphism? Um, uh, mod I mean, oh, that's a, <laughs> so you're wondering if there is a moduli space of moduli spaces. Right, right. <laughs> well, <laughs> um, I don't know. I don't think so. I don't think that. Um, okay. Because okay, so uh, if, that there's there's the notion of moduli space. So what's a moduli space? A moduli space in algebraic geometry is a variety. It's a manifold. So, okay. There is the notion uh, of moduli space of varieties. But that's not known. That's completely, uh, I mean, I told you about moduli space of Riemann surfaces, which is the moduli space. Riemann surface in, in algebraic geometry is a curve. Right. But if you increase the dimension, moduli spaces of surfaces, complex surfaces, so of real dimension four, then that's already, that's not known. So, so if you want the moduli spaces of moduli spaces, that's too far from, from the current uh, possibilities. So, but there, I mean, but there are, but there are studies 
of how, if you have a variety, if you have a manifold, people study how you can slightly change it, slightly deform it into a different variety. So that's a local thing, so, right, if you want. And, um, and that, that, that's studied. Uh, so if you can look at just, a, if, you, if you have a variety and see how, if you can deform it to another one by slightly deforming it, uh, then you can show, then what that means is that if you have a moduli space, which people don't know if there is and what's the, its construction, if you have a moduli space of those varieties, then those two will be, to, will correspond to closed points in whatever space there is. But in general, moduli spaces of moduli spaces, I don't think so, right? But that's... I see, okay, thank you. Okay, I don't know if there is some more comments or questions. Hello. Uh, I have a question for Andre. Mm -hmm. Maybe a stupid question, but I, I would like to know why why did you make make the restriction of G bigger than three in the last part of your talk? Bigger than two. Uh, you mean in a, sorry, uh, you mean here, for instance, and, and, and oh, the multiply space of, 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 of vector bundles, right? Right. Where is it? Oh, here, right. Is that it? Yeah. Sure, yeah, because um, um, so G is the genus of your of our uh, surface, right? Surface is the, I mean, I'm considering bundles, vector bundles over something like this, right? If you consider, so modulize, because the, the, for genus one and genus zero, so for the torus and for the sphere, things become, uh, slightly degenerate. So the moduli space of, uh, ve of vector bundles over the sphere is just one point. I mean, things degenerate. There are no vector bundles. Uh, there's just one uh, vector bundle over the sphere. And over the, over the elliptic curve, which is a uh, Riemann surface of genus one, then the moduli space is not one point. It's actually the, the moduli space. Sorry, no, I forgot. Uh, well, I can tell you what's the moduli space of vector bundles over the, an elliptic curve of rank one. So when the dimension, then it's isomorphic to the elliptic curve itself. Mm -hmm. But then, I mean, those are, when the genus becomes too slow, too, sorry, too low, uh, things become special somehow. And that's why, so for instance, this dimension does not work for genus one and, or, or zero. Yeah. Okay. Okay, I don't know if there is more questions, comments. Well, if there is Andre, I speak for Andre. He is always available to <laughs> to answer your questions at any time. But maybe it's time to finish. Sure. I would like to thank you, Andre, again. Thank it's you. Really, really a pleasure to have you with us. It was a great, great pleasure. It's me who has to thank. <laughs> and uh, thank you all once again for for being with us in this really nice talk. As I told you in the beginning, this talk was recorded and we'll, we'll put uh, available on the website of Maubi. And uh, see you around. And the next What is Seminar is in the middle of June. I, I, can, I don't, don't remember the precise uh, uh, timetable, but you can find this in the website of Maubi. And uh, stay safe. And Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks.
Yeah. I will.